All right, hi everybody. One more time, we are good to go. Just verify one more time. You have uh, some slides up there in front of you, and uh, you hear me good. Hear me well. All right, great. Um, let me make clear what tonight is, so that I don't underperform, as it were. Um, this is a one-hour presentation to go over topics that are what I would call very, very beginner-type topics. Um, these are things that, in my mind, nobody should even be trading um, with real money until they understand these intimately. Uh, my experience is, however, though, there are traders that are trading for a month, two months, a year, or more that really don't understand some of these topics. Um, I have like four hours of material here. And obviously, I have about an hour to go over this. I don't have to quit right at five, but there is another presentation I know a lot of you are heading to, which is from Traders Accounting about you know how to um, you know handle some of the tax issues at 5:30, and I'll give you the link to that if you don't have it as well too. So I do want to keep it to about an hour, and I think the best way to go about this is 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 this. I, in the last couple of weeks, I had a couple of questions that I think are real pertinent. So I'm actually going to cover those questions. Hopefully, those people are here. I told them to be here, um, but if not, we'll we'll see. And um, then I'm probably going to take your questions. And if I don't have a lot of questions, there are a couple of topics that I, I, I want to go over because I know just historically they are the most common questions that it has to do with, with, with money, how much is needed, um, order execution, um, what kind of orders, routes, all that kind of stuff. It gives you some, um, some answers to those questions. Some of the answers will surprise you. I bet you even you guys that have been trading uh, more than a year, I have a question for you. I bet you 75% of you get it wrong. Um, because there's some some interesting stuff out there, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, let me just excuse me one second. I'm kind of all alone here tonight, and yeah, I tell you what, I'm gonna stay on the mic, but I'm just gonna hum or something to myself for a minute here. So give me just one second. I have. I have couple people just email me that I have to send them a link real quick because they're having some problem. I don't know why. So you guys have, uh, how's, how things go today, everybody? I see there's, there's a couple people here from our room and the rest of you are from elsewhere. Where are you guys from? Keep in mind, it is, it is normal that you are, I, I'll, I'll read any questions. I know you guys can't see the other people here or the questions. That's the way the room is set up. Awesome day. Good. Where'd you guys, where'd you guys, obviously got an email, but how did you hear about us or how did you get to be here? So I, f I was going to let these people go, but I felt bad. There's couple people here that I uh, just want to get and they started getting right they try to get right for ask what platforms people are trading on you guys want to volunteer what platforms you're trading on I, I'm not I, I can t I, I'm not so sure that's a great question to ask everybody it's kind of like asking everybody who they're voting for the election I'm not sure that's really um, a topic which you can learn a lot from other people. It kind of depends what you want, what you're looking for, what you want to do. I guess some, to some extent, reliability or something. Well, let's leave that back burner because I do want to go over the the other important stuff here first. And give me just 30 more seconds, guys, and then I will be with you. Sorry for the delay here. Ten, nine, eight. Um, this is being recorded, recorded, yes, and you can find it on YouTube later tonight sometime, okay? I'm mostly trading, uh, okay. All right, so you, you need a broker for stock trading, all right. So let's let's take a run through um, and see what we have to talk about here. 
Um, again, I literally have four hours of stuff I can talk about. Um, but I'm going to handle a couple of questions first and then see what questions you guys have. And then and at the very least, I want to cover two topics that I know people always get a little confused about. Um, afterwards, traders accounting is going to be um, at 530. And I think, you know, if you if you are trading full time, I think you ought to at least, you know, listen to this stuff. They have the, the link here. Excuse me. The link is huge. I, I didn't have a shorter link. Why did it go way up there? That's weird. OK, so if you want to click on that and save that. Does that work? And save that for later. Um, that's where you can go at 5:30. You got you got to register or whatever. So you might want to do that while I'm talking. So if that's going on at 5:30. All right. So here's here's the first question I had. Uh, hi, I'm new to trading, and I've been watching your webinars, and I like your trading style. I'm interested in purchasing course, except I'm uncertain about the cost to enter trades you talk about, and how much capital is needed for each trade. Do I need to have a capital to purchase the whole stock? You're purchasing the option of the stock. I see the risk, but don't understand the initial outlay to enter the trade. Could you please respond so that I'm clear on minimum capital required to take the trade? Okay, so this is a great topic. And again, please understand, these are basic topics. If you've been here a long time, you may not learn a whole lot here. But let's first of all, he brings up options. Let's talk about options. As you know, um, at the stock charts, Michelin gives Melissa gives some option plays, but those are long-term plays. You, you generally don't day trade with options. I'm, I'm not saying nobody in the world ever has. I'm not saying you can't. But it's not very uh, opportune to do so because there's expenses, more expense to getting into options a lot of the times, um, especially if you're trying to do something early in the morning. Uh, option prices can vary a lot. I, I've done a lot of options in my time. I'm, I consider myself a relative expert on options to some extent. Um, but options can, can, can fluctuate a lot in value. And like, for example, if, if you go to try to take out a put on something that gaps down, can you guys tell me what the what the flaw is with that thinking? I'm going to ask you guys some questions here to keep you involved. What's the flaw with with saying, well, as a day trade, I'm going to I'm going to hold something 30 minutes. I'm going to take a put out on it so I can afford it better. What's going to be the problem with that theory? In theory, it sounds good. Well, instead of spending all this money on the, on the stock, especially if it's a $200 stock or something, say I'll just take out this put and blah blah blah. What's what's the problem though with that? There is a real flaw to that. Well, somebody's saying liquidity. That can be an issue, and, and, and you're right, Joe. I mean, a lot of times the problem with options when you're doing them short term is that uh, there can be a spread between them. You, you can't get filled as easily. The liquidity can be a problem, all those things. But even if you overcome all that, there's another problem. Yeah, Ron, bingo, exactly. Guys, the big thing with options, what's the key word when you talk about options? What do you have to manage? What do you have to know about? What do you have to control when you're doing options? The key word. Joe, Ron, you already said it, so I mean, you know the answer. Well, yeah, true, the underlying price is always key. But beyond the underlying price, there's the underlying price, there's the time to expiration, and there's the that, that magical unknown thing called volatility, right? In other words, given the same stock with the same strike price and the, and the same time to expire and the same underlying, that price could vary dramatically um, because of the volatility, right? In other words, the stock gaps down in the morning, the volatility can be so huge that you pay so much for the put that you could literally have the stock go in your direction for 30 minutes and still not make money. Correct? People who do options. You can have the stock move in your direction and you make zilch because the, the, um, the volatility dries up and what you paid for just kind of dissipates and even though it's going to your direction you're making money because it's going the right direction but you're losing money because the volatility is easing up. So it's not the it's not what we really do. So first part of that question here is you know do you use options? And no, not for day trading. I mean I've never done that to day trade. I, I've options is more of a long term strategy to me. And and options the biggest concept of options really is that you're you're just changing the reward to risk parameters is all you're really doing in a sense. There are many many different ways you can use options. The simplest way is to just buy calls on something because it's cheaper than buying the stock. But even then, you can buy in the money calls, out of the money calls, at the money calls. It's, it's, it's important to understand what we call, you know, the the the, the yield curve or the, the curve, the profit curve, really, of each one of those, because it depends where you think it's going and what you want to do. And that's way beyond our discussion for today. I'm not here to give you a, a full blown lecture on options, but just understand that, you know, just for simplicity. Again, talking to new people, save options for long term plays. And for most people, you know, you just you just want to be careful using options because they're they're not free trades. You know, they're uh, you, People, people sometimes get lulled into options 
for the wrong reasons. You have to get that underlying stock moving greatly in your favor for the options to work. And that's what Melissa does with when she makes her calls is with longer term plays. So in the room, we're talking about actually buying or shorting the stock itself. Okay. Now, the next question comes up, well, how much money do you need to, to buy or short a stock? Well, let's say you're, you're looking at a $25 stock. And, no, I don't want to use 25 because it'll, it'll confuse the math. L let's say you're looking at a $20 stock. Okay. And you want to, and let's, let's use a big number. Let's say you're going to buy 5,000 shares or short 5,000 shares. It doesn't matter. You're going to control 5,000 shares. Well, 5,000 shares times 20, that's $100,000. Do you need $100,000? And the answer is no, you don't need $100,000. Um, if you have a typical broker account, a typical margin account, you get four to one leverage during the day. And that means that you would only have to have capital in your account $25,000 and that would allow you to buy up to $100,000 of stock at a time and that would cover 5,000 shares of a $20 stock. Everybody clear on that? That's just some simple math there. Everybody clear on that one? I could pull up a little drawing board if you want me to. Of course it's hard to draw on it but <laughs> does that make sense? Good, good, good. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll throw that little drawing board at where to go. Okay. Oh, it's not going to work like that. All right. Um, now, there are other types of accounts you can have also. There are um, a, accounts that are called prop accounts where you can put up money, which in a sense covers your loss, your losses, and you have access to more capital in that. Now, there are different prop firms out there. And again, you got to be very careful. Um, and, and Melissa has one she works with. You can email her if you want a recommendation for one. But you got to be careful, number one, you want to make sure that, you know, you're dealing with somebody that's reputable, is not going out of business. And you also then, when you deal with a prop firm, you will get different leverage amounts. You could, for example, put up $5,000 and get 10 to 1 leverage. So you could control $50,000 worth of stock with only $5,000. Some people do more than that. Depends um, on the individual firm, what their policy is, and they may look at you individually. Uh, and that's the case, it's possible that you could, for five to $10,000, be able to control $100,000 worth of stock, okay? Now, when you, let's go back to a regular margin account. When, when you are with a regular broker, it's pretty standard, it's four to one. And by the way, overnight, it's two to one, typical broker account. When it's four to one with a typical, typical broker account, um, the other thing that you have the ability to do is to immediately reuse the money. And this is known as day trading rules, where as long as you have $25,000 in the account, you're qualified as a day trader. And day trading in the brokerage industry means that you get the four to one leverage and you can continuously buy and sell, buy and sell. In other words, if you took out those 5,000 shares for $100,000, you've used up to $100,000, but if you sell them or if you exit the trade, you can retake another $100,000 worth of stock. You can keep doing that 100 times throughout the day if you want to. Now, that is different for some of you who are coming from a maybe a regular investment account or maybe a very small account with $10,000 that you're, you have a college fund or something. That's very different because if you don't qualify as a day trader, that $10,000 you only get to use once. As a matter of fact, how often do you typically have to wait to reuse the $10,000, anybody? Anybody know? And you only get one-to-one. -one. So... In a, in a typical account, you buy ten thousand dollars worth of stock, right? And it, it, it right, exactly, right? It takes three days to clear. So if I buy ten thousand dollars worth of stock, that's all I can buy with ten thousand dollars. And then if I sell it, I have to wait three days to get that money back to be used again. So obviously, that's not what you want to do for day trading. It's not going to work. Um, if you do not have twenty five thousand dollars, you are not able to day trade. And you may think you're going to fool somebody, but you're not. There's very tight rules on this. And I don't know exactly the rules, but basically you're allowed to uh, buy and sell during the same day only only three, oh, is it three out of four days and take two days. I don't know the exact rules, but you're not going to be able to effectively day trade because they restrict the, number, the amount that you can buy and sell the, or, or enter and exit the same position in the same day. So if you don't have $25,000, you're you're and you want to day trade the only real option for you is to go prop okay three trades in five days i said four okay i was pretty close <laughs> but the point is without getting into the details is that you effectively cannot day trade um you, and if, if you violate it you know it's, it's a problem you know they, they give you a second chance and then they close your account so it's, it's not like you can fool them or trick them or anything like that right 
So, um, so, so there's, so that covers that issue, right? I, I don't know if the person who asked this question is here, um, but but that should cover capital that you need. So the capital you need is not nearly as much as um, what you may think it is, because when you multiply out the shares you're taking by the price of the stock, you're only going to be putting up a fourth of that or maybe a tenth of that, depending on what you're doing. Now the other thing is that sometimes confuses people. Um, is that the amount of money needed to buy the stock is not what we call the amount at risk. Okay, a lot of people get this confused. I get people all the time calling and saying, well, you said you, met, you made twice what you risked and you bought 5,000 shares of a $20 stock, so that's $100,000. You're going to tell me you made $200,000 yesterday. No, that's, that's not what we're talking about. The, the risk amount is the amount of money that you have decided you will lose before you kill the trade. Now, Again, I see the confusion because if you go back to a typical long-term trader, um, you kind of think in terms of, well, you know, I, I, I took out $40,000, I put it into the stock, and that money's gone, it's all tied up, and that money's at risk. And in a sense, it is a risk. You know, let me, I have a couple just simple slides on this, just to make sure I'm talking about everything I want to talk about. Yeah, here. Um, and when you have $40,000 tied up in a stock you're holding for days, weeks, months, is that money really at risk? Could you lose your $40,000? And by the way, you typically have two to one leverage, so you may have only a 20000 in the account, you're holding 40000 If you're holding a long-term position, and you have 20,000 of your capital, you've bought 40,000 worth of stock, is that money at risk? In other words, could it just disappear without, and the answer is, yeah, well, theoretically though, the answer is yes. I mean, it can disappear, right? I mean, if, if, if your $20 stock gaps down to $10 because it's a biotech stock, you're down to zero because you're two to one leverage, right? So you can literally lose all of your money. So it's all at risk. And that's where a lot of people think when they think risk, oh, that, that money's at risk. But when we're day trading, that's not really what we're talking about because when you're day trading, is there really any chance your stock's going to go to zero intraday? I, I'm not going to say it's 100% impossible, but the chances are much less than being struck by lightning because you'd have to intraday, the stock would have to drop that much. The point is during the day you're watching your position, you're going to get out, right? The only way that could happen, Ron, you're saying no, and I agree with you generally, but the only way that could happen is the stock was halted and it reopened, you know, at, at a fraction of the price. So while, while theoretically possible, you know, for the most part, we discount that. And when we're day trading, we have control over what we're risking. So when we talk about a risk amount, we're, we're talking about an amount that we have pre-decided is all I'm going to lose. So I may take out 5,000 shares of a $20 stock, and I may have $100,000 of stock tied up, and maybe I only have $25,000 in my account. But I'm saying, hey, I'm only going to risk $600 meaning that if those 5,000 shares drop more than 12 cents, I'm going to be out because that, that's hit my maximum amount. Okay, so that's what we mean by a risk amount when we're day trading. Now, you guys have a bunch of questions. Let me take your questions. You may want to actually... Oh, thank you, Gene. Yeah, um, I'm, I apologize. Gene made up a really good point. He, he, he said you might want to say what prop means because I'm, I'm saying prop and throwing the term around. And if I'm talking to newer people, it, we mean a proprietary trading fund. Thank you. It, 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 it's a proprietary fund. Um, we call it prop trading. It's proprietary trading. And what it what actually happens is, is what you're doing is you're not trading your account. You're giving money to a bigger fund to cover your risk amount, and you're a sub-account trading somebody else's account. So that's some people set up. They get millions of dollars together, and they say, okay, Gene, you want to trade? we'll give you a chunk of 100000 out of our big account. You can be a sub-account, you trade it, and you give me 5000 bucks in case you lose money, and when you get too close to using with that five grand, we're going to cut you off and you have to put more money up. Okay, does that make sense, everybody? Thanks, Gene. That was really a good point. Um, <laughs> just kind of blew right by what prop trading was. Okay, and if, you know, um, yes. If you have, Dale, if you have $25,000, if you have a $25,000 trading account, you can day trade with, the stock shares money if you're selling your shares before the market explain um yes absolutely well 
Dale, Dale's asking, let me read, if you have a $25,000 trading account, can you day trade with the stock swoosh Monday through Friday if you're selling your shares before the market closes? Explain. Y yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, if you have 25000 Dale, um, you can you can even hold overnight. You can do whatever you want. Um, you, you have to have a minimum of twenty five to day trade. Okay? If you don't have that, you can't buy and sell on the same day. They won't let you more than a few times a week. So you'll you'll get cut off. So you have to have twenty thousand twenty five thousand day trade. Once you have twenty five thousand, you can buy and sell the same day all you want, over and over again, over and over again. And if you wanted to, you you can hold because you, you stated it like you have to sell the close. You don't have to sell the close. But typically day trading that's what it involves. But if you you know if you did multiple things at the stock swoosh, yes, I mean we're done with everything, you know, either at ten o'clock or ten thirty or sometimes I'll do a play that lasts to the end of the day, but we're always exiting as a day trader at the end of the day. But if you decided, you know, you wanted to do other things, you want to hold some overnight, you can do it, yes. Okay? Makes sense? All right. Yeah, so no, nobody makes you sell at the end of the day. <laughs> nobody makes you do that. But if you want to day trade and if you want to not have the overnight risk, then that's what you do. All right. All right, good questions. Um, d does that cover everything on this topic about just initial money? How much needed? What's at risk? That kind of stuff. And hopefully... I'll get to a little bit talking about risk amount a little bit more because it is an important topic as well. I mean, you you can't avoid talking about risk. Amount. People try all the time to try and leave the risk equation out of their their when they talk about their trades, but you really can't um, because if I say I made six hundred dollars today on this trade, I made four hundred dollars on this trade, and I said, "Is that a good trade?" You really wouldn't know how to answer, right? the buds you wouldn't know how to answer because if i risk 200 bucks to make 400 watts that's a pretty good trade that's not bad but if i risk five thousand dollars to make four hundred dollars that's not a very good trade probably unless i get 98 percent of my trades right right so in other words to make 400 make 200 make 300 maybe it sounds like you're doing okay but then if your next trade you lose three thousand dollars that's why you always have to factor in your risk amount because what you make is always relative to what you're risking and that's what's important that's where a lot of traders get goofed up um, i personally do not use prop ron because i'm just you know i i, I probably would have if you know when i started there weren't prop <laughs> so i think there were times i would have not mind minded having a prop but i've uh, i've never used prop myself personally um, Melissa has uh, somebody I know she works with that she recommends. So, yeah, email Melissa for, for details about that, okay? All right. Let me ask next. Truly new people, do you have any questions, very basic questions? And this is the format where, you know, nobody can even see what you're typing but me, and nobody knows who you are. But this is the format to ask any questions that you're normally embarrassed to ask or don't want to ask. Um, I, I'm going to go to the second question up there in, in a minute, which actually is a big topic. Um so uh, all you guys hear, is there, is there anything on the top of your mind you want to say, you know, here's a question that's just been bugging me since the beginning of time? If, if, and while you're thinking about it, you don't have to throw it on out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and take this other question because it gets into what I consider to be a big topic that I'm always shocked uh, of how many people don't understand this. Um, I've been in your... What did this guy say? I've been... Oh, he's, that makes sense. In a trial, in your room. Love it. But you don't discuss how to enter these plays using market orders or stop orders. Thank you in advance. So let's talk a little bit about that, um, about the types of orders and terminology and that kind of stuff. Because this, this still, this this amazes me a little bit. I, mean, I, mean, I can remember when I started trading a long time ago, but I remember I went out of my way to make sure I understood this stuff. Um, and back then, there, there was no education. I don't want to say like that much of a dinosaur but there, there was no education there was nobody you asked you had to go figure it out or you know for the most part you, you, some of the stuff you talk to your broker you research it, you look it up you trial and error you figure it out but you figure it out before you start risking money and i'm always kind of shocked some days right i know people who've been trading for six months a year and they ask questions and i'm like scratching my head like you you don't know the answer to that question how long you've been trading you know it's 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 scary to me sometimes
Yeah, um, quick question before we get into that. Sure. Can you tell everyone why you mostly only short in the room? Um, this is something that uh, Melissa has believed in and I believed in since I first started trading. Um, shorting, I've always been in favor of for the very simple reason that it is unquestionably true that things fall faster than they rally. Unquestionably true. And you don't have to do a big research report to prove that. Just go look at charts and look at how quick they drop intraday or on daily charts compared to, I mean, all the time you'll see three weeks worth of gains wiped out in one morning, right? Two months wiped out in two days. It happens all the time. So it's not just the fact that, that it's um, a bigger move and faster typically but the great thing is is that you're less likely to get stopped out see the problem is on long trades. as a matter of fact today's a good example Ron. if you look at like some of the the retail today and you played those long right everybody look at retail today Macy's Baba were those easy trades I mean they didn't fly higher you know they, they struggled you know because you because <laughs> you, you just get a lot of selling because there's built-in selling pressure but when you get a stock that that does the right thing on the on the way down it usually moves much faster now you know of course it's it's not infinitely better but there's some odds to being short rather than long sometimes yeah in general i've always liked it better um i always looked at it this way too that um more times than not, it's novice, foolish people who are getting long when they shouldn't be. Um, way extended runs, way too late in the move, and then they have to get out. So um, that's what causes those back and fills on long positions. See, on the way up, even if there's a big buyer, a big buyer will come in and buy some stuff. But the big buyer knows that I, I like to refer to us, the little guys, as all the idiots, that all these idiots will get in late so the the big guy comes in and buys and he says okay i gotta stop buying because the price is too high i need to average down on my cost more so he'll stop buying and all these little traders are tagging on for the ride well price starts falling and they start stopping themselves out which stops up more people and stops up more people and boom 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 boom. and then the big guy when it gets low enough he steps in and buys a little bit and you you get this more erratic pattern like that that, that tends to happen and the, the reverse is not really true as much because the typical person is not shorting the typical person is going long so that's why you get the choppier move now it's not all the time there's sometimes where when you have what we call shock value a long position can be just as good as a short um, but you don't see that as often like all the retail today you know there, there's you know there are a couple okay patterns but there are all these slower grinding type moves that back and fill so they're just harder to stay with the position is the biggest deal if you knew you're going to end up making a new high at the end of the day you know who cares you just sit with it but you don't know that so you have to protect your position you start getting awkward patterns you get some back and filling and sometimes you stop out even though the, the pattern ends up higher you know what i mean so that's the reason um there is a preference to, to short and naturally you know we're in a bullish market when, when we get in a neutral or bearish market of course that advantage is tenfold even oh thanks Ron. yeah i think that was a good topic for everybody all right so let's talk about ordering real quick. I'm going to run through this from, from A to Z on, on orders. Okay, let's, let's talk about terminology first of all a little bit. You, you don't, when you're in positions, you don't buy and sell them. That's not really the right terminology. You, you enter and you exit trades. Okay, you enter and you exit. Okay? When you're entering a long position, you're buying the stock. That's the term everybody knows. I'm going long, I'm buying the stock. When you exit a long position, you sell the stock. These are the terms everybody knows. But when you enter a short position you're selling short or you can say just shorting the stock okay that's entering a short position and when you're exit a short position you're buying to cover or covering the short uh, you don't want to say you're buying the short because that is the same term as going long so just terminology wise that's it and by the way um, yes you can short stocks I have new people all the time that think it's a joke that you can short stock shorting a stock means that you make money as the stock falls there's a slide on that somewhere shorting you make money as the stock falls okay just the same as you make it when it goes up and what, what technically is happening is behind the scenes you are when you order short something you're saying to your broker and this happens all instantaneously in a split second you're saying to your broker let me borrow these shares okay so I'm not gonna pay anything for them. I'm just gonna borrow them from you and I'm borrowing them at thirty dollars okay the price drops to twenty nine 
so I buy so I buy it back at, at 29. I, I borrow them and I sell them. So I'm selling them at 30 borrowed shares. So I make I make the 30. Matter of fact, the money goes in your account as if you made money. It drops to 29. You buy it back for 29, and you made a dollar. Just the same as if you were long for 29 or 30, and then when you get the shares back, you can back to your broker. Um, the only thing about shorting is it leads to two technical differences that can can be a problem. Number one is when you go to borrow those shares from your broker, your broker has to have them. Um, in the past, years gone by, there was a pretty lax rule. Brokers, I think, kind of for the most part, just pretend lended them to you, which is actually called naked short selling and actually became a pretty strict rule not to do because it creates um, a problem because it actually becomes what we call a derivative i don't need to go to go into all this but it's like it's like options you're, you're creating new instruments and if things start to fall they fall twice as fast but bottom line is it, it's pretty strict rule now your broker has to have the shares available at the, at their location and be holding the shares to lend them to you for you to sell them so that's one problem is you may get a message back from your broker saying shares not available now every broker is different on this um, some brokers um, are better at having shorts available than other brokers. It's one of the issues you might want to, you know, check into when you're um, researching brokers. And I, for me personally, I suggest you research brokers online, do a Google search, look at the things that are important to you. Is it important that you short? Do you hold overnight? Is the cost more important than the speed? Look, you know, look at all these things. Um, and the second issue with shorting is that you could be subject to an uptick rule. The uptick rule is one of these jokes that's been in the market for, I, I, it's just such a pet peeve of mine, this uptick rule. Um, when I started trading, there was an uptick rule. And what an uptick rule means is that if a stock is falling, if the bid is dropping from 25.25 to 25.24, 23, that you could sell stock that you own, that's not a problem. But if you want to enter a new position, by short selling if the uptick rule is in place you can't sell when the bids dropping from 25 to 24 you have to wait until the bid upticks from 24 to 25 and then sell into that meaning there's somebody out there who's willing to buy the stock and you're not forcing this the the, the sales onto the the market i.e the market makers um, and actually the rule used to be slightly different for nasdaq or or um New York Stock Exchange orders, different uptick was slightly different. I don't even know if that's still true today. Don't really care. Um, and, and then for for a while, and I'm going back a lot of years. Then they they started a trial where certain stocks were void the uptick rule. So to see how it worked, it worked. And then pretty soon the whole market they banned the uptick rule. It was gone. And then I don't know when it started again, but then they started uptick rule for extreme moves, more than ten percent, and then certain stocks and. And now to tell you, I don't even know what the exact rule is when an uptick rule applies or when it doesn't. But if you go to short and you have a hard time getting short, you know, it's because there's an uptick rule in place. Um, it, it'll generally tell you somewhere. If you look, there's different rules. Um, I, I, to tell you the truth, I don't pay a lot of attention to it. Most of the time I try and enter in a way that um, it, it's not in the middle of a free fall when I'm entering it. Melissa does the same thing. So, um, but just so you know, if you ever have a problem, if you think, you know, man, I'm. I, I'm selling at 25.25. The bid is 25.25. Why is it not happening? It could be because the bid has to tick up to 26 for you to get filled. Okay. All right. Any questions so far on that stuff? So shorting, we were on on orders, types of orders. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, know. I, I don't. I don't want to go into Ron. I'm not even. I'm not even tell you Ron's question. Um, Okay, now, there, now there's two other things I want to talk about with entering orders, buying and selling. Um, and that is, and one of the reasons I go into this is, there's, there's two reasons you know this. There's the difference between actively and passively buying and selling. Do you guys know the difference between actively and, buy, actively and passively buying or selling? Yes or no? Just curious how much time it should take going over this. Actively and passively buying and selling. Do you know the difference between that? When you're active, and just some of the terms in case you're not trying to talk, if you're actively buying or selling, you're, you're hitting the bid, you're lifting the offer. If you're passively doing it, you're, you're offering out, you're bidding for something. Okay. The half no's, half yeses. All right. Um, the only reason this is important for two reasons. That with some brokerages, particularly in some prop accounts, that you can actually make money by bidding for a stock rather than um, 
lifting the offer. Okay, now what do I mean by that? Let me um, let me pull up a level two screen. There's a level two screen. Okay, so this this God, I pulled this level two screen like ages ago, and this is IBM. I don't even know what price it's at today. So IBM, if you can read this, the bid is 195.19, the offer is 195.24. Okay, so just so we get these terms straight, if I want to go long and I want to enter this position, there's two ways to do it. Okay. I can it's called lift the offer. You don't you don't hit the offer. That's the wrong term. Not that it matters, but just for you fanatics, you you lift the offer. I could go ahead and buy this at 195.24, and if I'm the first one there, I am guaranteed guaranteed to get filled. However many shares now they only show 100 there, and there's 200 there, and blah blah blah. So there's about 800 shares here. If I enter an order for 800 shares, and I beat everyone else there, I am guaranteed to get filled. Is that clear, everybody? There's, do you see what I'm saying? Do you see there, these are hundreds? So there's 800 shares on the offer at 195.24. And if I enter an order to buy 800 shares of IBM at 195.24 and I beat everyone else there, it's guaranteed I will get filled at 195.24. Is that clear? There are no tricks. Nobody can change their mind. Nobody can say, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to sell them to you. Is that clear, everybody? I'm not kidding. I, I, when I don't get an answer, I'm not sure if you're confused or if I'm stupid or. Clear, clear, clear. Okay, because it makes a difference. Okay. Um, the other way to buy something is to say, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go over here and bid at 195.19, and hope that somebody who wants to sell is going to sell to me at 195.19. Now, there's advantages and disadvantages to doing that. Okay, right. It's called bidding for something. Sitting on the bid, yeah, right on. Sitting on the bid, okay. Now this would be the passive way of doing it. Why in the world would you ever do that? There's a clear disadvantage, right? If I buy 195.24, boom, I'm in the trade, right? I'm in the trade. If I bid 195.19, I'm not in the trade. I'm letting somebody else make the decision to get me in the trade by selling to me. Does everybody see that big disadvantage? I'm not in control of my entry. I'm saying. I'll get in, and because I'm going to save five cents, I'll get in any time you say it's okay to get in by just hitting my bid. Is that got it? That's that's the one big disadvantage you're not in control. The second big disadvantage is you may never get in the trade, because what if the stock's moving up? Nobody's ever going to sell to 195.19. All right. So you may say, what are the advantage? Why would you ever do that? What's the advantage? Well. There's only two reasons you'd ever do this. And one is because if you have an account that pays you to add liquidity, instead of, you know, when you, when you get your statement, you, you pay these ECN fees. In other words, you, your, your commission may be 3 or 4 or $5, whatever it is. And then there's another $2.35 for an ECN fee. You guys all see those? If you know what I'm talking about? And your broker will tell you, well, that's the commission, and then we pass on exchange fees to you, right? Well, it's possible instead of paying those fees, you can get paid those fees. You're, you, you have to have a broker that's doing that, and, and that it's called getting paid for liquidity. And if you bid 195.19 and you get filled at 195.19, you will actually make $2.35 per thousand shares instead of paying it. Does that make sense? And yes, I'm not kidding you. I'm serious, right? Ron's done it, right, Ron? I've done it. You can do that. Make sense? So that's one reason, and that's almost a different type of trading. That that's almost like where you're you're into this scalp mode and you're playing market maker. We call it where you're you're buying at the bid, selling at the offer, and you're always getting filled that way. Okay. So the other reason, what would be the other reason you'd ever do this, somebody? And and, and in this case, forget about getting paid for liquidity. What would be just a normal account, and you got to pay no matter what? What would be the only other reason that you would bid for something? There is another reason, and I do do this sometimes for this reason. What's the other reason? Well, bidding to exit a short, it's really not a different issue than if you're bidding to enter a long. It's the same issues, right? You may or may not get filled. Somebody else in control. But true, you, you could bid either to exit your short position or to get into a long position. But it really doesn't... It's not a different set of parameters. It's the same issues, right? The other time you'd want to do this, guys, is when there's a big spread, right? If you're in a $20 stock and it's early in the morning and there's a $0.15 cent spread, you're literally paying that $0.15 cents to play the game. 
Now, I'm not saying it's always the smartest thing to do, but that is another time when you might do it. A stock, you know, falls and you're willing to get into it. You bid for it and you capture that 15 cents, as it were. So if the stock's at $20.15 by $20.30, you bid 15, you get filled. Well, maybe it's worth it because you're saving 15 cents or whatever it is. So that's the other time when you have a widespread, okay? So just FYI. We'll come back to this tradeability slide in a minute. Okay. Actually, I think we're there right now. Okay. So the way most people do it is you're, you're actively trading, you're hitting the bid or you're lifting the offer. But if you want to passively do it, you're sitting on the bid or you're, you're offering out. Okay. Um, let's talk about liquidity and then we'll talk about the types of orders, market order, that type of stuff. Um, tradeability. This is a formula. I, this is, I made this up, so you're not going to see us anywhere else. Tradeability equals volume plus spread plus depth plus thinness. or Actually, I should say thickness. That's really the wrong word there. Does that make 100% sense to everybody? Yes or no? Do you understand every word on there and what that means and how that equates to no no yes no no okay let me, let me let me run through what it means when you're looking to see we talk about tradeability we're saying can I trade this stock in other words sometimes the stock trades so poorly so thinly that you don't want to get into it because the spreads 20 cents and you're not going to pay 20 cents spread to make a 20 or 30 cent move on the stock it's, it's not going to work so there's times when a stock is too thin. So one of the first things people look at is the overall volume of the stock. Uh, that is a good first indicator, but it's not the absolute indicator. In other words, the issue becomes how many shares you want to buy. If you're buying 200 shares of something, you, you can practically buy or sell anything on the planet you know, for 200 shares because there's always somebody sitting there for one or 200 shares. But you start buying 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 shares, getting filled now becomes an issue because when, when you normally would have just sold 100, you get filled. Now if you go to sell 3,000, well, maybe there's only 1,000 sitting on the bid. And the question is, what happens to the next 2,000 shares? Are they going to get filled or are they not going to get filled at what price? So you really want to look at all these things. Number one, the overall volume is, is something to look at. And if you're going to be trading three, 4,000 shares, you better be trading a stock that's trading, you know, two, three million shares a day or something like that. But even that's not a guaranteed rule because there are stocks, you could look at two stocks that trade two million shares a day and they could trade very differently. So there are things you want to look at are what, these other terms in here. The spread is the difference between the bid and the offer. Okay. Obviously a perfect spread would be one penny. It's bid at 25.25, it offered 25.26. That'd be perfect. One penny is as tight as it can get. They can't overlap, right? But even if the spread is tight, that may not mean a whole lot because, and again, I don't, well, let's take IBM and, and just use the terms. Um, the depth means after the high bid drops off, what comes next? And for IBM, in this case, it's one penny lower. So in that case, the depth is, is good. You're only dropping a penny, and then you drop three cents. Well, for a $200 stock, that's nothing, right? So that's what we're looking at by depth is after the high bid, and let's take a $25 stock. If 25.25 is the high bid, well, if all those bids disappear, I hope 25.24 is there, and then 23, and then 22. Do you see what I'm saying, everybody? So that when the 25s run out, there's something one penny below that, okay? And then the thickness is how many are at each level. So if I'm looking at, you know, right here in IBM, there's only 100 shares at 19, and there's only 300 at 18, and then 100 at 15. So if I'm going to sell 1,000 shares, and I sell them all at once with a market order, I'm going to be down to 11 for 500 of those shares. Does everybody see that? Whereas if I were to buy right now, I would get 800 shares at 24, and then the rest at 25. Does everybody see that? So that's overall volume, spread, depth, thinness. And there's one other thing you really have to look at too. And it's not listed as a thing because it's not really another thing to look at. It's a timing thing. Does anybody know what the other thing you should really watch? If you don't know a stock and you're concerned about the liquidity, you know, because, you, you know, when you're concerned about liquidity, getting in isn't always the problem. Sometimes you get in, it's when it stops out and it's flying, you know, at the speed of light and you can't get out. That's the problem. So you want to, what's the other thing you want to look at? Anybody know? Anybody have a clue? All four, I'll give you a hint, all four of these things could look really good when the stock's just sitting there. Just 
it's cruising along, it's not going up, it's not going down, there's a bunch of people buying at 195.19, a bunch of people selling 195.24. What do you what do you want to check is folks, if you can, if you have the opportunity, watch it when it starts to move. Watch it when it drops a little bit and see what happens. Sometimes a stock, especially during the morning, when it starts to drop a little bit, that spread goes from a penny to eight cents. The depth goes from every penny to every nickel. Does that make sense, everyone? So if you see the stock drop, if a $25 stock drops 10 cents, but the level two screen stays intact and you still have good volume, spread, depth, thickness, well, then it's probably okay. Right, yeah, Ron's rephrasing when it's moving, does it stay solid for getting it out? Exactly, right. And if it doesn't, then understand that it may look okay, but it may not be okay when it starts moving, okay? All right, so let's go on here to, as a matter of fact, was it, was it one of the questions? Did I do the two questions, or what's the other question? Yeah, right here. Are you using market orders or stop orders? Can anybody tell me, is this a new trader or... Uh, anybody tell me what's inherently wrong with this question? See, when I see this question, I know this is a very new person. What's wrong with that question? Are you using market orders or stop orders? What's wrong with that question? Nobody knows. It's kind of like if you went to a restaurant and the waiter asked, what kind of wine would you like? Would you like your wine to be red or medium rare? Yeah, Dale, excellent, right. Yeah, you guys are getting it now, you're, as I'm saying you're getting it. These are not opposite terms. <laughs> They're not opposite terms. Market order and limit order are opposite terms, right? A stop order can be a market order or a limit order. So when you say, and this is a very common question I get is, do you use a market or a stop order? And no, that's, that's not a question. You could have a stop market order, right? So the real question is, is it a market or a limit order? And let's go over that real quick because that's another. And this is where, I, remember I promised you that I would have a question that I think 75% of you get wrong. I'm going to sneak it in here pretty soon, so I'll be ready for it. Where are we? Move. How come this won't move? All of a sudden, there we go. Oh, that's why. Okay. So market order and limit order, first of all, are the two opposite terms. Okay. Market order is real simple. Y what you're doing is you're saying to the market maker or the specialist, you're saying to the market, I want to get in this stock right now at any price you feel like. Okay. I have to get in or I have to get out, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're entering or exiting. This is irrelevant in this case. Nobody cares in this case. But you're saying a market order means I want to get in. So the only thing you need to specify in your order is how many shares. I have 500 shares, market order, buy or sell. That's all that's needed, right? That's all you need to say. Dear market maker, I have 500 shares, sell them at market. Go. That's it. And the good thing is you will get filled. You will get filled. Guaranteed, you will get filled. As a matter of fact, that's one of the rare times if you don't get filled, you can go complain to somebody and you know, have something fixed. What's the disadvantage of a market order? <laughs> Ron, I think you know the answer to all these questions. I'm going to somebody else take a shot at it because you, you pretty much have the answer correct there, yeah. Yeah, right. You're going to get filled for sure, but you're not real sure where you're going to get filled, right? And this is especially true if you're trading a thinner stock or if you're trading something, you know, in a fast paced time, like first thing in the morning. Because um, you're basically saying, hey, fill me whenever you, you know, whatever you can fill me, I'd fill me, I don't care. So you get filled, but you don't know where. And before we talk about pros and cons, right, right, Dale, exactly. Let's talk about the other, the other way to do it is a limit order. Okay. With a limit order, you're saying that I want to get in, but wait a minute, Mr. Market Maker, I'm only going to pay so much. I'm going to put a limit on what I'm willing to pay. So if the stock is currently trading 25.24 by 20, I'm sorry, yeah, 25.24 by 25.25. So forget the dollars, 24 cents by 25 cents. I want to get in right now, and I want 3,000 shares, which I have to specify. Um, 
but I'm not willing to pay more than 0.27. So you need to fill me at either 25 where it's at or 26 or 27. 3,000 shares. So go do it. And what will happen then is you'll put your order out in the market. And if there were 3,000 shares available at 0 0.25, 0 0.26, 0 0.27, and you're the first one there, you will get filled. That's guaranteed. Now, don't forget, some people think they get screwed. You don't always get screwed. Sometimes somebody beats you there. This is all computerized. So in this case, when you're seeing a level two screen, you're not getting screwed. But if you don't get filled, if you see 3,000 shares there and you hit it and you don't get filled, it's because somebody beat you there. Um, but keep in mind, let's say that there were 500 to 25, there were 500 to 26, and 527. You only get filled for 1,500 shares, correct? That's all you get, 1,500 shares. What happens to the other 1,500 shares, everybody? You see what I'm saying? You say, Mr. Market Maker, I'm going to limit this to 0.27. Order goes out in the marketplace. There are only 1,500 available between 0.25 and 0.27. You got filled for 1,500. What happens to the rest of the order? Yeah, well, for most people, I mean, you do have an option. There's something called an all or nothing order where what you would say is fill me for what you can then kill the rest of the order. That, that Most people don't do that. I don't do that. Um, but what happens then that other 1,500 shares stays out there on the bid waiting to be filled. So you'll be sitting there waiting, and if the price comes back down, you get filled. If it doesn't come back down, then you never get filled. Okay? Clear, everybody? And naturally, the huge advantage to a limit order is, of course, the reverse of the disadvantage of a market order, and it is that you can put a price on what you're willing to pay and not get screwed, as Ron put it, if you get a bad fill on something. Um, and by the way, sometimes you're not screwed. Sometimes it's just what the market will bear, you know, and, and sometimes you get screwed. But at least with a market order, you're filled if that's what you need to be. With a limit order, the disadvantage, of course, is going to be the reverse of the advantage of a market order, which is that you may not get filled for all the shares that you wanted, okay? Which leads to the next key question that everybody in the world always asks, which is how much of a limit should I put? I know there's a couple of questions that I'll get to in a minute, but I kind of have my eyes half closed while I'm thinking here. How much of a limit should I put? Well, this is something, folks, that I cannot answer for you as, as a number. If I said to you, oh, you give it two cents, that would be an idiotic answer. You should tune out of this <laughs> room and say that guy's an idiot. I, I can't tell you what the number is for two different reasons. Number one, every stock is going to be different, right? I mean, if there's a five cent spread and the stock, then the next level is a nickel away from that. I mean, you know, it, it may simply not be possible to get filled within two cents or three cents or one cent. And the other big issue that you have to decide, it's a personal issue, which is how much are you willing to pay for it, right? It's kind of like, you know, Ron goes to buy a, a, a new car and he goes to buy a Jaguar and um, says, Paul, I, you know, they're selling them for 120000 uh, What's the most I should pay for it? And well, I don't know, Ron. I mean, what? You know, maybe if you don't pay 120, you're not going to get it. Maybe they'll come down to one. You know, it's a matter of what are you willing to pay to get the car. You know, I, I don't know, what, what, whatever you think. But it's the same thing in the marketplace. Um, when you put a limiter out there, you have to ask yourself, okay, if I put three cents and I don't get filled, but I would have got filled at four, and this goes on to be the play of the day and runs 80 cents, how mad am I going to be that I missed the entire play to save a penny? That's one question you have to ask, right? The other question you have to ask is, well, am I willing to spend 10 cents for a play that's only going to move 20 cents? See, and this is where you have to decide. A lot of it comes down to what your risk reward is on the play. In other words, when you're taking a, a 50 cent stop amount on a bigger stock to run it, you know, $2.50, well, paying a dime is not a big deal right? Because you're talking about a five reward to risk being brought down to a four point something reward to risk, right? But what if you're looking at a smaller stock and you're looking at a 20 cent target or even got even a 30 cent target and you take a 30 cent target with the 10 cent stop and then you add 10 cents onto the entry, that's 10 cents onto the entry, 10 cents off the, the target. Now you're a one to one trade instead of a three to one trade. Do you see what I'm saying, everybody? So there's, a, there's just a first question that has to be asked, which is what are you willing to pay, first of all, period? Whether you can or not, or whether it's doable or not, what are you willing to pay? What, what makes sense to you to do? And then the next question becomes, what do you have to do to get filled? So you may say, okay, 
looking at this whole situation, I'm willing to pay six cents to get in this because, you know, I'll get mad. If I could have got filled at six and I put a limit of four, I'm going to be mad if I don't get filled. And if it takes eight, I'm willing to skip the trade. You see what I'm saying? So you got to decide that first. Then the next question is, okay, I'm willing to pay six cents. Do I really have to do that? And this is when you look at the level two and you look at the spread, the depth, and the liquidity overall. And you say to yourself, you know what? This thing ought to get filled within two, three cents. It just ought to get filled. Okay. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is you don't have to get filled on that initial second you hit the trade. It depends how you trade again. If you trade all breakouts, breakdowns, high of the day, low of the day, and when you get into something that's already moving, you may never get filled if you don't get that initial fill. But if you're taking other types of entries on pullbacks um, before the whole world is getting longer, getting short with you, um, most of the time after that triggers, like if you an order out there for 4,000 shares, you give it a two cent limit. Maybe you get 2,000 shares, you let it sit there, and 20 seconds later you get the rest of the shares. Um, if, if you, depending on the type of trades you take, that probably happens 90% of the time, okay? So does that make sense to everybody? So I mean, this is a huge question, but it's not a yes or no answer. I, I can't tell you what to give a stock in terms of a limit order because first you have to decide based on your reward risk to trade what is okay to you to, 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 to do. And number two, then you have to look at the level two screen and the overall trading in the stock and say, well, how tightly could I get filled, right? Make sense? Everybody? Now here I'm not sure. I went over a lot of stuff. Do you guys understand? Please, a little feedback. Do you understand totally? Repeat the whole thing. Do you have a single question? Was it a revelation? Was it, wow, I learned something? Was it, this is boring, get me out of here? Got it, got it. Everybody got it. Okay. All right. Did, did you learn something here? Or was this just like, I got my head on the desk sleeping here? <laughs> <laughs> I get these questions all the time, so it's a matter of, you know, of, of, of who's here. Okay. So that's limit versus market. Quick question. Um, which is faster, if there's a difference, a limit or a market? <coughs> which is faster, if there is a difference, between a, a limit or a market? If, if Who's going to get filled first, in other words? Who's going to get filled first? Assuming you get filled at all, who would get filled first? Assuming you get filled at all, who gets filled first? Market or limit? Everybody answer this. All you in here. I want to see a bunch of answers out there. Who gets filled first? Market or a limit? Assuming that, you know, you, you get filled. I mean, obviously, if you put too tight of a limit, you know, but assuming you put a limit, you give enough limit that you do get filled. Who gets filled first? Be limit or market? Come on. Nobody can see your answers but me. So when I call out your names and type them in the room and make fun of you, don't worry about it. No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, man, Ron, how long have you known me, Ron? Jeez, you're like the... A couple other people got it right. I don't know. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. The the Typically, I don't know if you guys are smart, or maybe I said this once before, as some of you listen to me, but 90% um, of the time, people will say a market order because it's just what it... Obviously, it's a market order, of course. It's going to get filled first. That's what you use it for. No. Um, a, a limit order, actually, believe it or not, is quote unquote faster now i put it in quotes for a couple reasons number one if you actually talk to somebody in the market who knows this up and down they will give you an answer i, I was at this get together once and I've, I've known you know people that are in the brokers business and I, I know people that eat this stuff for lunch and they could sit there and talk to you for 35 minutes about exactly <laughs> what route will fill what first and what order and all the exceptions and that's what happened when i, I asked somebody this question and, Boy, did he know what he was talking about. He went on to every route and when it gets filled first and when it gets filled second and when the exceptions come in. And there's all these rules that are just so incredibly ridiculous today that it's not a big difference today. Okay, But I want to point out that historically it, it has been a big difference. A limit order gets filled first. And even today, even though it's very muddied, that you're still better off with a limit order in terms of getting filled first. It typically goes to the front line. Here's historically why it is. Because remember the wording I first said when I said a market order, you're saying to the market maker, here you go, sir, please fill me anytime you want it at any price, <laughs> but fill me. Well, guess what? If the market maker has any discretion at all, you know, if, it, if it's able to be finagled, are, is he going to fill you as low as possible or let the stock bounce and fill you as high as possible? He's going to fill you as high as possible, right? So that's historically where that came from, and there's never a rule to prevent that. So the limit orders tend to go to the front line, market orders to the back. Um, 
if you're trading liquidity, it doesn't matter. You know, there's so many times it just simply is not going to matter. But the re only reason I bring it up is that so many people say I'm using a market order because it's faster, and that is incorrect. I just want to get you out of your mind that you need to use a market order because it's it's better. It's it's not better. It's a guaranteed fill. Now, everybody put on your thinking caps for a minute. If a market order is not faster, is there any way you could take a limit order and make it the same as a market order and then have really the best of both worlds and really the only thing you should ever use? I, I, I see your question, Dale. I will. I will. I, I see your questions, guys. I will get to them. Just just stay with me a minute here. Because again, it's not going to matter if we're going long or going short. That's irrelevant. We're entering a position. You follow me, Dale? We're entering a position, and I don't care if it's going up or going down. The question is, how much are you willing to pay to get into it? Nope. Guys, I have, I have not used a market order my whole life. I can duplicate a market order if I want to by using a limit order and giving it a, I don't know, say 50 cent limit dollar limit five dollar limit you see what i'm saying you, you can just use limit order and now do i really use a dollar limit no I, I use a reasonable limit but let's say for example you're using it as a stop order and i'm not at the screen well i want to make sure i get filled so i'm not going to put a stop limit and we'll come to stop in a minute but i'm not going to put a stop limit with a one penny limit because i mean i get filled but you can duplicate a market order by putting a really wide limit and then you will get filled better sometimes You'll never get filled worse, but you get filled better sometimes. And you will always get filled. And then when you're... So the bottom line, what it comes down to is, and again, if some of you disagree with me, you've been trading a long time, that's fine. Again, I'm talking to a new person. If, if you have devised your own system, I, I don't need to hear it or you know whatever, that's fine. But here's the golden rule. When you get into a trade, you should use a limit order with a limit set to the max that you're willing to pay. Okay. When you get out of a trade, you should use a market order. Or, quote unquote, if you understand how to do it, use a limit order with a with a limit that duplicates the market order by being so wide that you're never gonna get have a problem. Okay? Make sense? Now, real quick, I'm already like at the end of my time here. Let me take a couple of your questions and then I, I want to discover stop. Let me go back here. You guys have a bunch of questions to miss here. Um, okay, Dale, again, short or long doesn't matter at all. It's, it's not relevant. I, I don't even need to even bring the term up ever. It's entering a position, exiting a position. Okay, when you're entering a position, Dale, the thing is you don't have to get into it, right? You may want to get into it, but there's a price that you will say, I don't need to get into it, right, Dale? When you get out of something and you're stopping out, you have to get out of it, right? So it doesn't matter if it's long or short, the issues are the same. It, it's, it's long or short, it's irrelevant. So whenever you enter a position, I think you should use a limit order with a limit set to whatever you're willing to pay. And don't be too cheap. Sometimes people, it drives me nuts when somebody says they missed the best trade of the day. The stock runs a dollar. Everybody's applauding how much money. Oh, I missed the trade because they gave it a one penny limit. Well, why did you do that? You know, if you could go back in time and spend three cents, would you spend three cents? Oh, yeah, of course. Well, why didn't you do it initially, right? Put up a front initially. You're not going to automatically get screwed, <laughs> but put up initially what you're willing to, to trade because it can be just as bad of a sin to miss a trade as it is to spend too much to get into a trade, right? Make sense? Now, the next, and Ron, the next thing I'm going to talk about real quick is a stop. To summarize stop, just think of this very simply, is a stop means computer do this for me that's all it means now it gets confusing because we talk about stop orders meaning if i'm in a trade i need to put a stop on it so i really hate this term that they have in the brokerage side that says what a stop order is a stop order has nothing to do with your stop order does that make sense in other words you need to get out of a trade and you want to put a stop order on it <laughs> yeah exactly one car you're right you're right that's what i yell at people for you know you wouldn't pay the one penny and then you missed an entire trade that made your whole week. It's, you know, there is a limit. I mean, you know, you're not going to pay up too much, but these people are trying to get stocks for one penny when the thing's going to move a dollar. It's silly. But anyways, might I digress? Um, a stop simply means, Mr. Computer, please do this for me. So if I want to do a market order, I can make it a stop market order by saying, I want to get in at any price, but Mr. Computer, 
don't tell the market that until it hits 25.25. So the stock's going up, it's at 25.20, 21, 22. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so I say, Mr. Computer, if this thing hits 25, get me in. So I put in a, mark, a stock market order that says, when the price triggers 0.25, I'm going to set my, my computer is going to send order to the market for a market order to buy now, and I'll get filled. Simple enough, right? Why would you ever do that? Well, when you have a play in place and you need to leave for the day or for an hour or for five minutes, you typically put a stop market order in place so the computer will take you out of a trade. A stop limit order is the same thing. It's a limit order that the computer is going to generate. But now we need two numbers. This is where it gets a little confusing to some people. You're going to say, dear Mr. Computer, if this price goes over 0.25, please buy these shares for me. But I don't want to pay more than 0.27. So now you have two numbers that go in. The stop amount is 0.25. The limit amount is 0.27. So you're saying, dear Mr. Computer and Mr. Market. Well, actually, the market doesn't hear this because you're saying to the computer, Mr. Computer, please when the price hits 0.25, please send a limit order to the market to buy now, but with a limit of 0.27. Make sense? So I don't, I don't use a stop order unless I'm not there or unless I'm so bored. <laughs> I just can't sit there with my finger on the button anymore. Okay. Um, also, most of the time, not everybody will tell you this, but most of the time, professional traders... Um, that even though there is a number that I'm saying I'm not going to go long until this number, I'm not going short until this number, most of the time there's this thing that comes in and, Ron, what's the word I'm going to use? And it happens so quick and it's such, and this is something I teach in my advanced management strategies class, um, that you, 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 you can't type it to a room of people, you oftentimes can't even yell it. It's just, the word is anticipation. That even though I'm not going to buy to 0.25, sometimes you see it coming, you see the bids build, you see it happen, and sometimes you, you jump the gun by a penny or two. So if you have a stop and you can't do that, if you if you are, are doing it with what we call finger on the button, which would be not uh, a stop order, then you can do that. Um, it's oftentimes it's not critical where it really matters more sometimes if you're shorting something at the low of the day, you're buying something at the high of the day. Sometimes that surge comes in, you may not get filled, so you got to be smarter about how you do it sometimes. Okay. I need to quit here. So let me draw a line in the sand right here. I'm just going to quit. I will take any questions, either new questions that you have or questions you asked and I missed by mistake because a lot of you start asking a lot of questions there. I think I got them all. So is there anything you want to ask me? And if you don't have anything to ask me, did you enjoy this? Did you learn? If you learn one thing, I'm happy. Did you learn one thing at least, everybody? And or do you have any questions I missed or you want to discuss? Now's your chance. Good. Ron, you just like hearing me talk <laughs> because you knew all this stuff. <laughs> okay, time was Again, some of you have been training a while. Maybe you learned one thing. And if you did, you know what? It's worth an hour. Right, and some of you, a lot of you are new, and a lot of you learn a lot of stuff. And so some of you may have been over your head because if you're brand new, I imagine this is a little over your head. But at least you know what the issues are and what you have to learn. Um, good. All right. Great. Cool. 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 All right, guys. Um, I'm going to sign off. If you want to go over to Traders Accounting, they're doing a talk uh, about taxes and how to set yourself up, um, which I think is a great thing. I've known. Um, I, I don't personally use them because I was set up to do this before I knew them, but I've known Traders Accounting for 10, 12, 14 years or something. Um, Jim Crimmins is the guy over there. And, uh, you know, if you want to go listen to him, go listen. We don't get anything from it. It just it just benefit to you if you want to go listen to him, okay? Thanks, guys. Thank you much. And um, for those of you for those of you that are new, 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 um, our next class is going to be a week from next weekend, the Golden Gap course. I know some of you are new, new here and just listening in. That's going to be coming up the 13th and the 14th. You email Melissa if you're interested or me if you have any questions. And um, you can pick up the, uh, for the next week, or you can pick up the wealth class for free as part of that. That's a, it's a three or four hour class that Melissa does. Okay. And if you're brand new and you are interested in a trial, email me or Melissa or info at Stockswish 
and uh, we'll see about getting you in for a trial if you haven't had one before. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Have a great evening, and uh, say hi to everybody over at the accounting place if you're going over there. And we'll see you guys in the morning for those of you in the room. Take care.